There's something about mountains that captivate the human spirit. The rugged terrain and towering peaks pose a challenge so indomitable it beckons to us, igniting our imagination and fueling our thirst for conquest. Deep within the Rocky Mountains stands Pikes Peak, America's mountain, and one that has epitomized this primal longing for centuries. It started with just reaching the summit through any means necessary, but for 101 years now, the mountain has been home to the most dangerous race in America, the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb. Each year, drivers challenge the mountain, climbing for 12.4 miles and navigating 156 turns through turbulent weather, wildlife, and an ever-decreasing supply of oxygen. While cars and drivers have evolved and gotten faster, the mountain has also morphed, becoming more challenging and dangerous over the years. This is a story of adrenaline and aspiration, of bravery and breakthroughs, and of legends and legacies. This is the story of Pikes Peak Hill Climb, the race to the clouds. Pikes Peak was formed millions and millions of years ago and inhabited by the Ute people long before Zebulon Montgomery Pike showed up. Zebulon was an army officer, tasked by Thomas Jefferson with exploring and mapping the region, including the giant mountain he called Highest or Grand Peak. He figured that if he could reach the top, it would provide a great vantage point for his work. But this was easier said than done, and harsh weather conditions stopped Zebulon Pike and his team from ever reaching the top. Instead, it would be another 14 years later, in 1820, that a young botanist named Edwin James completed the first recorded climb while also recording the fauna. Zebulon's explorations weren't forgotten though, and many referred to the 14,000 foot mountain as Pike's Grand Peak before it eventually became known as just Pike's Peak. Fast forward nearly 100 years and Spencer Penrose burst onto the scene. Spencer may have graduated bottom of his class at Harvard, but he went on to make a fortune in mining and real estate enough to fund his love for extravagant and exotic things, including a pet elephant named Tessie, which he used as a caddy at the golf course. He did a lot to boost tourism in Colorado Springs, including his eclectic European-inspired hotel, the Broadmoor. But the most notable project he funded was constructing a toll road to the peak. To market the new road to the public, Penrose decided to create a race up it, where the winner would be given $2,000 and the Penrose Trophy. The event was called the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. The first ever event took place in August of 1916 and drew big names in fast cars. Ralph Mulford, a racer who had just missed out on winning the first ever Indy 500 by a second, was scorching fast, getting up the mountain in just 18 minutes and 24 seconds during practice. But when it counted, it was a far lesser known driver, Ray Lentz, who became the first king of the mountain and took home the gold and silver trophy with a time of 20 minutes and 55 seconds. He did so in a Romano Demon Special, which had been modified to fit a V8 out of an aircraft. The event was a great success, and competitors were eager to come back next year, but that didn't happen. With the First World War ongoing, the newly founded event was put on hold after just one year, although in 1919, a tank attempted to climb the mountain. When the race returned in 1920, there was a new winner each year, starting with Otto Loesch in a snowstorm, then King Riley, a flatlander from Nebraska, and then his friend Noel in a car he called Tin Lizzie, built from cast off Model T parts he'd reportedly found in an alleyway. The first really dominant driver to make a name for himself was Glenn Schultz. He was the first to officially beat Ray's time with an 1847 and 1923, and would go on to win seven of the next 11 years, with him, Otto, and Charles Myers taking turns cutting the record all the way down to a 1647 in 1932. But while Schultz and his studs had a great run, it was time for the most famous family in Pikes Peak history to enter the spotlight, the Unser's. Louis and Marie Unser left Switzerland in 1895 to start a new life near the base of Pikes Peak, unaware of how pivotal the mountain would be to their family's legacy. Louis was interested in all things mechanical and passed this passion on to his sons, Louis Jr., Joe, and Jerry. The three brothers somehow climbed to the peak on a motorcycle with a sidecar in 1915, before the mountain road was even finished. They began entering the famed time trial and quickly accumulated a handful of second and third place finishes, before it was Louis Jr. who first claimed the spotlight, winning in 1934 with a time of 1601 while driving a Stutz. 
The Legacy was briefly put on hold though, with the heavy truck competition in 1935 taking the place of the usual race. This was different, but everyone was keen to get back to fast cars, including Louis Unser, who was just getting warmed up. He won in 1936, 37, 38, and 39, driving a variety of cars and bringing down the record even further. He finished second to the talented Al Rogers in 1940, then won again in 41 with the 1535. He was ready to kick off another winning streak, but World War II put the race on hold for another four years. The hiatus didn't seem to affect Louis, who shook off the rust and immediately shaved a few more seconds off the record, winning in both 46 and 47 while driving a Maserati. Al Rogers hadn't thrown in the towel though, and the Unser rival took the crown for the next four years. The first to get a 14 minute run was neither Al nor Louis though, but Keith Andrews in 1954 with a 1439. In 56, the Unser name was back on top, but this time it wasn't Louis, but instead his nephew, Jerry's son, Bobby Unser. Bobby was something else, and would win again in 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, and 63. Beyond that, he was crushing the record year after year, setting five in a row and bringing the time all the way down to a 12.05. So, who could stop Bobby's record-breaking reign? Well, none other than his own younger brother, Al. Although in 66 and 68, Bobby would win again, and brought the record past another minute mark, a task which was getting more and more challenging, this time clocking in 11.54. Like many of the drivers in the story, Bobby was extremely talented, both on and off the mountain, and had won both the Indy 500 and the Race to the Top in 1968. Through his career, he became close friends with the famed racing driver Mario Andretti, and managed to drag him out to the mountain. Despite Bobby's coaching, Mario ran into technical issues in 67 and 68, and realized that he was never going to beat Bobby anyways. Bobby decided to enter the stock car class the next year, and let Mario, fresh off an Indy 500 win, have a chance to become king of the mountain. Mario made the most of the opportunity, and added a Pikes Peak victory to his expansive resume, free to move on to other challenges, like a Formula 1 championship. Unsurprisingly, Bobby also won in the stock car class. The Torino he was driving was bankrolled by Ford, who paired the best driver with one of the best engine builders, Smokey Eunuch to claim a stock car class record and garner some publicity for the company. Bobby had accumulated the most wins ever at Pikes Peak, and tied his uncle Louie for overall wins, both with 9 under the belt. He decided to take a step back though, and leave way for other drivers and vehicles to have their time in the spotlight. There were now nearly 300 cars showing up each year to challenge the mountain, with competitors trying all kinds of wild ideas to gain an advantage, like the propane powered Mustang from renowned tuner AK Miller. The cars themselves were evolving in shape too, becoming specialized for the mountain climb. It still took a while for the advancements to catch up to Bobby's record, which stood for more than a decade before being beaten by less than a second by Dick Dodge Jr. in a dedicated hill climb chassis, a Wells Coyote. The record was dropped to an 1144 when Bill Brister hopped in a Wells Coyote, and then down to an 1138 in 1983 when Bobby's own nephew, Al Jr., got behind the wheel of one as well. It seemed like the climb had settled into a rhythm, and that people had figured out the fastest car for the job. But, there was about to be a revolution, led by the queen of the mountain, Michelle Mouton. You are always sliding one side, the other side, it's like a ballet, it's like a dance, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Audi of America pushed to enter the rally class, and won with John Buffum behind the wheel in both 82 and 83. To garner even more publicity and attention, they wanted to bring over the Audi factory team driver from France, Michel Mouton. In 1984, Michel came over and won the rally class, but with a time of 12 minutes and 10 seconds, she also finished second overall, and if the team was able to figure out some issues with the car, she was certain that she could both win the next year and also beat the record. A year passed and she returned with her 5-cylinder turbo Audi. Fellow competitors and organizers didn't know how to feel about the alien European car and female driver who was coming for the record. Some praised the technology of the car and the skill of Michelle, but others were starting to sweat, especially when she was setting blistering fast times in practice. There were some complaints that Michelle was driving too quickly outside of the track and had been kicking up too many stones trying to warm her tires, and whether justified or not, she was fined twice and told that she could no longer drive her car on the public roads not even to the start of the race. 
After a press conference, the fines were instead paid to charity, and Michelle was allowed to sit in the car in neutral, as her team pushed her to the start. Unfortunately, the track wasn't as fast as it was in practice, still slick from rain the night before. But Michelle seemed to have a vendetta, and pushed harder than ever. Poor guys, you will see. Because this gave me a boost like never in my life. Never I will lose this race. It's impossible. When she reached the top, she had won the event, and it wasn't even close. No one was even within 40 seconds of her. On top of that, she'd become the first and only female driver to ever win the event. And despite the conditions, she'd beaten Al Unser's record, dropping the time to an 11.25. This was a huge win for Audi, and they wanted to keep momentum and sales coming, so they tried to make a race happen between Michelle and Al the following year, both in identical Audis, King of the Mountain versus Queen of the Mountain. This never came to fruition as Michelle had joined Peugeot instead, and Audi was planning to send Walter Roll to the mountain. But that didn't happen either. Instead, they did end up with an answer the following year, just not Al. It was Uncle Bobby, now 52 years old. He'd been enjoying retirement when Audi asked if he could help them with some development work and trying to crack 200 miles per hour down in Talladega. Bobby's work was invaluable, and Audi was keen to showcase all the new records he'd helped them set. But Bobby couldn't help but dream of what the car could do at the mountain, and he wanted to drive it. Audi said no, but Bobby had never signed a media release, and said that if they didn't let him take the car out, he wouldn't let them show all that they'd accomplished in Talladega. And so, Bobby returned to the mountain, 17 years after his last appearance, in an attempt to reclaim the record back under the Unser name with the help of an all-wheel drive Audi. The car was everything Bobby wanted, and he slashed the record down to an 1109, while taking his 10th overall win, a feat which has yet to be beaten and may never be. The next year, Audi would get their chance to fly out two-time world rally champion Walter Roll, but things weren't going as smoothly as expected. Apparently, Audi called on Bobby again, as Walter's times up the mountain were worryingly slow. Audi asked Bobby for setup advice, but he told them that the car was fine, it was Walter's driving style which was the problem, and that the mountain couldn't be treated like a rally, but instead its own entity. The next day, Walter hopped in the car and shocked everyone, even Bobby, who was blown away by how fast Roll was able to heed his advice and adapt. More so, when race day came, Walter smashed through Bobby's own record, taking the time all the way past the 11 minute mark down to a 10.47. The next year, the European domination continued, this time in the form of a carbon Kevlar bodied Peugeot 405 with four wheel steering. The driver was Ari Vatten, a Finnish rally driver who had won the World Rally Championship in 81. Like many of the other drivers in the story, just watching Ari behind the wheel was a treat, and many got to enjoy it thanks to all the cameras strapped to the Peugeot and others placed strategically up the mountain road. The footage was put together to create a short film called Climb Dance, which won multiple awards around the globe. The driving wasn't just pretty though, it was also fast, and Ari carried the cameras up the mountain in record time, edging out roll by just over half a second. Again, an unser wanted a shot in the car the following year, and this time, it was Robbie Unser, Bobby's son, who stepped up to the plate. Robbie managed to win the 1989 event, although he couldn't quite beat the record, just a second behind the time set by his own dad and Ari. Robbie wasn't deterred though, and won again the following year too, although there weren't any record-breaking rally cars in attendance. Still, the American efforts were catching up quickly, and in 1993, Paul Dallenbach shaved a few more seconds off the record. This was another great achievement, but the following year, the record was about to be cut down more than anyone thought was possible. Rod Millen grew up on a farm in the hills of New Zealand, ripping around in carts his dad had made for him and his brother. He enjoyed racing around the gravel roads and ended up entering hill climbs to get his license, eventually driving for Toyota in 1991, then winning the Mickey Thompson off-road series in 92, 93, and 94. Rod had entered Pikes Peak over the years, but wanted to get more serious about it. To keep their prize driver on board, Toyota stepped up and supported him in entering the mountain time trial. The car was a tube frame monster, with 850 horsepower covered in a carbon fiber shell reminiscent of a Celica. To counter the thin air at high elevation, the team hired an IndyCar designer and aerodynamicist to help the car make around 2,000 pounds of downforce at 100 miles per hour. 
There was an issue though, and the effects of the aero dropped off steeply if the car had more than 15 degrees of slip angle. This was a challenge for Rod, who was sitting way back in the car to help the weight distribution. He was the man for the job though, and was able to use the aero to maintain far more speed over competitors throughout the 12.4 mile climb. In 1994, the race had nearly ideal conditions, and the record was actually beaten multiple times, when David Donner got a 1040, then Paul Dallenbach got a 1027, then Robbie Unser to a 1005, and finally by Rod Milne in the Toyota Celica, with a time of 10 minutes and 4 seconds. This was the first time a Japanese manufacturer had won the event, but Toyota wasn't the only one in attendance. Suzuki first entered in 1989 with a Suzuki Cultus. At face value, the Cultus seemed like an odd choice, with the usual 1 liter engine only making 52 horsepower. For this one though, Suzuki used a turbocharged 1.6 to make around 350 horses, and then they got another, squeezing two engines into the tiny car, one for each axle. The twin engine trick was actually first seen at Pikes Peak in the form of a Volkswagen Golf in 1984 although the car had some issues and never quite yielded the payoff the company wanted for such an ambitious project. Suzuki ran with the concept though, and squeezed nearly 700 horsepower inside of a lightweight Cultus, weighing under 2,000 pounds thanks to FRP and carbon fiber. To drive the car, Suzuki brought over a driver known as Monster, Nobuhiro Tajima. The nickname Monster was partially due to Tajima's wild driving style and rally success, but also his physical stature. Compared to the average Japanese man, Tajima was enormous, both tall and strong with giant hands. Despite his intimidating presence though, Tajima is known to be one of the sweetest drivers around. He dreamed of racing at Pikes Peak ever since he was a child, and finally got his chance in 1988, driving a Mazda and finishing third in the production GT class. The next year, Tajima was jammed into the tiny Suzuki Cultus to compete in the unlimited class, but didn't make it to the top. It took the driver and car pairing a while to find their feet, but they did win the Unlimited class in 92, even with the car falling apart right at the finish line. And then they won again in 93. This year they actually set a new overall record, but about 10 minutes later Paul Dallenbach took it for himself, beating out Tajima by just over half a second. The car had evolved year by year and was up to nearly 800 horsepower. It was also immortalized for its efforts in the video game Gran Turismo 2. But despite being so close to success, this was the final iteration of the Cultus, and the car was swapped out for another seemingly unusual one, a Suzuki Escudo. The race prepped car was almost unrecognizable compared to a stock Escudo when it showed up in 1994, still with a twin engine setup. The car had a lot of development to go, and finished with a 1051 in 94, well behind Rod Millen's incredible 1004 that year. The team kept their heads down though and showed up again in 95, with 900 horsepower and 900 kilograms. They were ready to break some records. This year had atrocious weather though, and the decision was made to not race all the way to the top. Instead, the finish line would only be part way up. The Escudo seemed to be performing well, but was still a few seconds behind Rod Mill and Celica in qualifying. For the real run, Tajima set a time of 7.53 flat on the short course, and awaited Rod's attempt. At the split, the Celica was already over 5 seconds ahead, and when it finished, well, the drivers didn't know who had won, with no one around to tell them at the improvised finish line. Rod was confident in his performance. But then the news came that the underdog had somehow made up time in the upper section, and won by just under a second. Rod was perplexed, partially because his team had told him he had more breathing room than he really did, saying he was 14 seconds ahead at the split instead of just 5. Tajima Monster Nobuhiro capitalized and celebrated as the first ever Japanese driver to win the event. The rivalry between the two drivers continued for years, although it seemed to be favoring Rod, who won the following year with a 1013 and then the year after with a 1004.5, less than half a second away from beating his own record. Both drivers wanted to be first to break past the 10 minute barrier and made huge changes to their vehicles. Tajima brought out a new single engine Discudo and the most well known one thanks in part to how incredibly fast it was in Gran Turismo games over the years. Rod went another direction, and ended up bringing out an unusual vehicle himself, a Toyota Tacoma. Again, all the usual tricks were employed, and the truck was winning fast, helping Rod continue his winning streak through 98 and 99. 
Despite the impressive performance of the truck, it still wasn't quite able to break the record or the 10 minute barrier. After the record had fallen nearly 40 seconds in a single day, it would end up taking years before someone could shave off anything more. The 2000s were filled with a diverse crowd of vehicles and winners. Many returning kings such as Paul Dallenbach, David Donner, and Robbie Unser, but no one was close to the record. Part of this was because the course itself was changing. With hundreds of thousands of visitors paying to drive up the gravel road each year, a large environmental organization called the Sierra Club filed a lawsuit, claiming that the highway violated the Clean Water Act due to the gravel pollution. Different strategies were employed in an attempt to mitigate the impact, like the use of a gravel stabilizer in 96, but eventually it was decided that the road would have to be paved. This didn't sit well with many drivers, including Rod Millen, but against their wishes, paving began in 2002. While the cars had more grip on the pavement, it was installed in scattered chunks throughout the course and was often far narrower than the dirt road. Each year, drivers would have to adapt their driving style and their vehicle to the ever-changing road, which was causing more people than ever to go off track in places that weren't usually an issue. Still, each year drivers would come and challenge the mountain, including Tajima. It had been over a decade since his overall win, but he hadn't given up his dream. In 2006, he entered another Suzuki, this one supposedly sharing some trace DNA with the Grand Vitara. The car was fast in qualifying, with the fastest time in both the bottom and top sections. Tajima was eager to challenge the record, but once again, dark clouds rolled in and began dropping snow and popcorn-sized hail. The full course was deemed too dangerous, so once again, Tajima would have to settle for the shorter course, two-thirds in length. While it wasn't the opportunity Tajima wanted, he still made the most of it, and became king of the slightly shorter mountain for a second time. The following year, Tajima returned, this time with an opportunity to go for the record and the 10 minute mark. The car was faster than ever before, and after 13 years, Rod Millen's record finally fell. But the 10 minute mark still hadn't, with Tajima posting a 10.01. He'd continue to try year after year, winning the next four events in a row as well, but still not quite able to crack the goal. He was running out of time too. It was now 2011. Tajima was turning 61 years old in two days, and the track was nearly fully paved. Once completed, it would be the end of an era for the mountain, and would usher in a new wave of completely different cars that wouldn't have to deal with the gravel sections. On top of all of this, 2011 was also the year of the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, the most costly natural disaster in history. Tajima wanted to give the people of Japan something to smile about. He was on a great run, but just 500 meters from the top, disaster struck. His car had overheated and was spewing water from the radiator. The power steering had also failed and made the car extremely difficult to turn. Thankfully, Tajima was of course named Monster, and his physique helped him get the car to the end of the race. And after decades of attempts, he was the first to break the 10 minute barrier with a time of 9.51. Finally, he'd accomplished his goal and just in time. The following year was completely different on the now fully paved course. While faster, the road was extremely unforgiving, resulting in one of the most dramatic crashes ever seen when Jeremy Foley's Evo drove off the mountain and rolled over a dozen times. Thankfully, both him and his co-driver survived. Despite the danger, other drivers saw potential to put their name in the history books, including Rod Millen's son, Reese Millen, who entered with the 2012 Genesis Coupe. Reese drove incredibly through the rain and set a new record of 946, beating out Romain Dumas by just two hundredths of a second. However, many felt the mountain time trial was no longer the same in its paved form and maintained that Tajima still had the real record, never to be challenged again. Meanwhile, others feel the true record still belongs to Rod, before paving began at all. Nevertheless, in this new era, it was a new record, and it was obvious that there was still time on the table. Peugeot noticed this opportunity, and after struggling financially, decided to pool their resources to create a car and hopefully recapture some of the success they'd had with Ari Vatanen's climb dance. For the next four months, a team of 12 rushed to complete the 208 Ti. The car had 875 horsepower, weighed 875 kilograms, and was full of parts from Peugeot's Le Mans program. 
Feeling confident the car would perform well, they partnered with Red Bull, who promised better marketing and coverage of the event, along with providing a driver. And not just any driver, but one who had won the past nine World Rally Championships in a row, Sebastian Loeb. Paired with the car, it's no surprise the Peugeot made it to the top the fastest. But what was shocking was just how fast it had done it. Sebastian and the Peugeot obliterated the record, taking off 1 minute and 32 seconds for a time of 8.13. Your average Joe wasn't going to be able to compete against these factory-backed, one-off, purpose-built hill climb monsters paired with the best drivers in the world. So instead, people turned to a variety of different classes to have their fun at the mountain. There was now nearly 20 different classes, with new ones coming and going, everything from fuel-guzzling big rigs to electric cars. Following his big win, Tajima had actually switched to the electric class, citing that he did it to raise climate change awareness. He was successful in the class, winning and even beating his record, although still nowhere near Loeb and the Peugeot. Electric cars did have some unique advantages at the mountain though, especially at high altitudes. The higher up the mountain competitors got, the less oxygen there was, and combustion cars would drop in power. Electric cars, on the other hand, didn't have this issue, and some thought that this could be the key to beating the Peugeot's time. In 2018, Volkswagen went all out to test that theory, with the fully electric IDR. In years prior, Volkswagen Group had been dominating at Le Mans, the Dakar Rally, and the World Rally Championship, but left all motorsports in 2015 after their emissions scandal, sometimes known as Dieselgate. When they returned, they wanted to show that the company had turned over a new leaf, and debuted their first ever electric race car. The IDR took inspiration from the Volkswagen entry back in 1984, again using dual motors and making around 670 horsepower. Although, of course, this time they were electric, and unlike the Golf, the IDR had some serious aero. The goal was to set an electric record, shooting for Reese Millen's winning time in the 1600 horsepower Drive EO PP100 in 857 in 2016. To drive, Volkswagen got Romain Dumas, who had won three of the last four years in a Norma prototype. When the big day came, conditions were good, and the IDR whirled away, enthralling the crowd with its unusual sounds and incredible speed. Roman handled the quirks of the car well, and made the most of its advantages to clock an incredible time. Not only had the car beat the electric time, it had also beaten the Peugeot's time, reaching the summit in just 7 minutes and 57 seconds. After 101 years of Pike's Peak, this is still the fastest time to this day, although it's more than likely that the record will be challenged again as technology continues to advance. While this video has mainly focused on the overall winners, there are hundreds of incredible stories that have unfolded as enthusiasts have found themselves drawn to the summit. The idea of driving up a mountain road seems so simple, primitive, but the clear goal and lack of regulations has made Pikes Peak an incredible canvas for innovation and skills to shine for over a century now. Taking on the mountain is not without risk, as weather events or even animals on the road can turn someone's dream into their final moments in an instant. But while there is inherent danger to taking on such a challenge, some people can't live without it, and accept the risk with open arms, knowing they'd rather take their chances to showcase their love and passion than live without having ever tried. For these people, I'm grateful for providing us such awe-inspiring stories and pushing new boundaries. While racing up mountains might not be your calling, I hope this video still resonates with you, and that you can find and pursue your own passions like the inspiring characters in this video. One way to work towards those goals might be with the help of this video's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant offers thousands of fun, interactive lessons to learn about math, data science, and computer science. Whether you'd like to learn about programming and AI to advance your career, or some engineering lessons to help optimize your own car's performance, Brilliant can be a great way to reach your goals without spending thousands of dollars or years of your life in school, like I have. Outside of YouTube, I spend my weekdays working as a researcher at a university, dabbling in science, data analysis, machine learning, and more, so I can appreciate how valuable the skills you can learn at Brilliant are. Lately, I've been working a lot with robots, but while I like cars and all things mechanical, I never actually took engineering, coding, or anything like that in school. So, I've been using Brilliant to catch up, and feel more confident about taking on new robotics projects. Plus, I've been getting some ideas for my own build. Right now, you can try everything Brilliant has to offer free for 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash huntersmoon or clicking the link in the description. 
The first 200 people to sign up can also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it and that you have a great day.